welcome to the nonprofit show and happy Friday. We are excited you're here. It's another episode of the nonprofit show, another ask and answer. And that means that we have so much gratitude always, but especially on Fridays to National University Fundraising Academy, because these uh, people, the trainers, the representatives, they come and they spend their Fridays with us to really dive in deep into these conversations. So I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, but most importantly, Jack Alato is here, CFRE and trainer at Fundraising Academy, very involved in the sector. Um, again, if you if you joined us for our green room chatter, you were hearing a little bit about one of his lifetime mentors that he's getting to see this weekend. Um, but Jack has so much investment into the sector. And I love, I mean, I love you, Jack, but I love also the the commitment and dedication that you put into the CFRE certification because you are so dedicated to helping all individuals achieve that responsibility. So thank you. Thank you. And it's an, an honor for me to be on with the nonprofit nerd. Well, you know, nerd used to be a bad word. When right. I was in high school, it was a bad word. But when it when it's on you, Jared, it's a compliment. Well, thank you. Yeah. And and it's a compliment when I say it too, because you're right. It used to have this negative connotation. I'm like, no, no, it's a compliment. So uh, we also want to compliment our presenting sponsors and extend our, you know, gratitude also to these friends of ours. So a shout out over to our besties at Bloomerang American Nonprofit Academy, again, Fundraising Academy at National University, where we've stolen Jack from today. Nonprofit thought leader, your part time controller, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These companies, day in, day out, they're here to support you. They're here to support your mission and to help you do more good. So, to help you do more good, check them out because they really are amazing. We only play with amazing people. So, everyone here is amazing. Speaking of, the latest and greatest is this amazing app. So, you can on your, your smartphone, here it is, on your smartphone, <laughs> you can scan the QR code and upload the app. And so just a few hours after today's live conversation we're having right now in this very moment, you will get a notification that this uh, show, this broadcast has been updated. And if you also stream us on broadcast or podcast, we're still there. So don't worry, you can find us on those platforms as well. Okay, my friend, Jack, are you ready? Yes, let's get going. Well, you know how this works. So I'm going to read the question aloud. And for our viewers and listeners, maybe this is your first time coming to us, but these questions come from you. And so you email us, you tweet us, you send us some messages on LinkedIn. There's so many ways you can send in your questions. Um, we save them. We reserve your questions for every single weekday on Friday, hence the Friday Ask and Answer episode. So these come in from our viewers around the nation. So Name Withheld in LA wants to know, I am the development director of a successful mid-sized nonprofit in the Western US, hence the LA. I have been asked by a similar nonprofit in the East to consult on their fundraising efforts and their strategies. Is this a conflict of interest? Take it away, my friend. So here's the thing. I do not think it's a conflict of interest. But what I think is a more important thing for this organization is to have a code of conduct. You know, if your organization, your board has developed policies about conflict of interest, about code of conduct, then you would look to those policies as a way to answer this question. However, in my opinion, I do not think it, it is a uh, a conflict of interest. But there are some things, uh, some codes of conduct for consultants that I did find. So okay. here's the here's the one thing that I find: safeguard confidential information. For example, this organization in Los Angeles, you cannot share your donor information in a consultancy with any other organization unless you have the donor's permission. So that is the number one thing. If they think that you're going to give them a consultancy and find help them find donors from your own database, that's a no-no. 
The other thing that I think is really important, and Jared, you're a consultant, you know this, I'm a consultant, I know this. Don't accept a consultancy if you are not competent in providing the services. That's really important. A lot of consultants I see, they say, hey, ah, there's this RFP for a consultant shop. I need the money. I'm going to go for it. For example, in my own life, I'm not an expert at planned giving. I would not be a consultant for an organization that needs somebody who really knows and understands planned giving. The second part of an ethical consideration for a consultancy that might help this question is don't advertise services you are not professionally competent in. And I see a lot of organization, a lot of consultants that do that. So we want to avoid those two breaches of ethics. And, and finally, looking, as I said earlier, look in your own code of, of uh, conflict of interest policies if you have them. And the other thing that I highly recommend, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, is to review the AFP code of ethics and professional standards. And some of those things are operate with integrity, whether you are working within an organization or you're providing consultant services to them, have be transparent, be truthful, truthful, be trustworthy. All of those things are important in any relationship with any nonprofit. I don't know what I could add to this, Jack. That was phenomenal. Great. All of it. Yeah, all of it. And you know, you're right. I always go back to the code of ethics, uh, you know, from AFP. And I remember, you know, when I started my consultancy, really, that was when I had so many organizations asking me, well, you can bring the big donors, right? And I'm like, no, you know, and really talking about you know, yes, I'm very privy to a lot of information from a lot of different organizations. I've been in their donor database. I've talked about, you know, strategies for major gifts of some of their, you know, some of their larger donors. I never take that information to another organization, right? And that is that is a big thing. So I love that you go back to the policy at the organization, and then overall code of conduct. So I think that is, you know, fantastic. I also, and I know you do too, Jack, come from a place of transparency. So yeah. I would certainly share this with my supervisor, let them know that this has been a request. You know, when you use the word consult, I'm curious if this is, you know, like you're taking on a paid opportunity or if they're simply oh, yeah. for a conversation. Um, I think that's different. I was actually recently asked to have a conversation, not a paid consultant consultancy, uh, to share how uh, essentially the Benavon breakfast works, Jack, right? Like how do I we know do, that? Yeah, I know yeah, that. How do we do these, yeah. these fundraising yeah. breakfasts to an organization that's never done one before? And so I'm simply going to have a conversation, 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, and give them the lowdown of here's how it works, but it's not a paid gig, right? Yeah. And so I, I really do think name withheld, you know, looking at this from a standpoint of, is this a paid opportunity that they're asking you for, or is it simply, you know, a, a collegial favor that they're asking? So um, all good insight from you, Jack. So thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Yeah. And we wish you the best. And, you know, I, I do think that the more we share with one another, we can learn from one another. So I'm all for sharing, sharing Intel, but not intellectual property. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey, I love this name Tanner. As I shared, this is my son's name, but he does not live in Memphis. Um, so Tanner in Memphis wants to know, we are looking into putting more funding towards internal professional development and training. How much per person should we dedicate to this and should it differ from department to department? I realize this is a broad question, but we really need some help with the first time investment. This is a great question, Tanner. Yeah, and it's a it, it is a great question. And you know, you know, in the green room where we're talking about some of our favorite mentors and some of our great favorite supervisors. And I think one of the characteristics of of the supervisors who I had who I really appreciate my experience, them mentoring me was when they said to me, Jared, Jack, I want you to give me as part of your annual review, your professional 
development goals. Tell me what you want to do to grow professionally. It could be CFRE. It could be learning more about planned giving. It could be being great at an annual giving campaign. I think that the way to deal with this question is to ask your staff to give you their professional development goals. It might be planned giving, as I said. If it's finance, if and it doesn't have to be just in the fundraising department, let's say the financial department, ask those employees to give you their professional development goals. Then when you get all of those, if it's in social services, ask them. Maybe they want to get a new master's degree or something like that. So when when and if you really want to keep your employees, which is also a, a something in this question, then give them the opportunity to grow professionally. I worked for some large organizations that had very rich budgets around learning about fundraising. Those organizations, I would absolutely uh, avail myself to every training opportunity, even if it was just a webinar or the, you know, going to an AFP webinar or some other webinar that's put out there uh, or reading blogs or whatever it was. So if it's in finance, maybe they want to learn more about financial metrics. Let them go to a professional yeah. development thing. Then once they give you their professional development plan, look at your budget and dis determine where you want to spend that development, that professional development budget. Is it really important that an annual giving officer learn more about major gifts and put your money in there or get getting their CFRE? One of the questions I get all the time is CAP, Chartered Advisor in Philanthropy. If you know that's something that a lot of development professionals are getting right now, go for it. I say yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I also say yes to, you know, being a lifelong learner because there's so much to learn. Um, and I, and I believe we're never done, right. We're constantly evolving. We're learning something new. What's the, what's the latest trend? How is technology changing what yeah. we do? Right. There's so much. The other thing, um, you know, shameless plug is the fundraising Academy has a portal that you can go to. It's free. There's tons of information there. Yes. The nonprofit show free oh, tons yeah. of information there. And so I do think regardless of budget, you know, um, and I love your answer, Jack. And, um, and when I'm in that position, I, I do always say, what are your goals? Like, where do you want to be? You know, who do you want to be when you grow up and how can I support you? Yeah, and I come from it as a place, you know, that it's like it also might mean that we're developing this person and they don't stay here. But for me, I see it as we're doing the best for the person, for the community, for the sector, for the the nation and the globe at large. And so, really, like uplifting and empowering this person, regardless of those attachments to the agency. But I, I will go back to there's so many free resources out there. Uh, another shameless. I'm doing a webinar July 19th with Fundraising Academy. Um, and so, you know, again, there's so much information out there. So uh, yeah. I love that you're looking at this because I do think it absolutely needs to be a line item. in the You budget. know, you know, you mentioned the nonprofit show. Yes, it's free, but but here's what a, a development supervisor could do: could say to Jack, Jack, yes, I'm going to give you that time to yes. on Fridays to go to the nonprofit show or to go to that fundraising academy in July, and you, you're not going to be disturbed. Don't worry about doing anything; just attend that. That's also part of professional development: time, giving your employees the time to do those things. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that, that is something often overlooked. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just got back from Chicago. So Bryce, I'm not sure if we met, but um, your question we're going to answer right now is, do you have any advice on what an annual pay raise would be for a C-suite nonprofit executive? We are thinking about a flat 3%, but we are also concerned that this amount won't help with our staff retention. Oh, um. Pay this raises, is, Jack. What do you say? Yeah, so the first thing I say is I do not like across the board pay raises. Okay. And I'll tell you why. And I, you may have a different opinion. Pay yeah, raises should be based on performance. 
They should be based. Some of your employees are going to outperform other employees and a 3% pay raise may not aid in, in uh, employee retention if they feel that they have done above and beyond. Pay raises, in my opinion, should be based on job performance and performance should be based on their job descriptions and the goals that the, you and, and they and you or you and they have put together for that year. That's how I think you really, it's, it's really, I just really don't like these across the board pay raises. It's, yeah. it's great. It's very equal. It's egalitarian. But if you are an underperformer and you know, you're an underperformer, you say, Hey, I don't have to live up to anything. I want to get that 3%. Or if you're an overperformer, you're going to say, why am I working so hard to achieve my goals when I am not being financially rewarded. So it's a double-edged sword. Yes, across the board may help with some employee retention, but I'll tell you what, I don't think across the board pay raises will help with others. The other thing is 3%, sorry guys, we have an inflation rate much higher than 3%. Yeah. That's At least not the last time much. I looked. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I, I, I don't really like the number even. Yeah. So anyway, that's, yeah. those are my opinions. I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, well, I'm I'm going to give it to you, Jack. So I, I love hearing yours and I and I, I respect that. Recently, I was working with a client and here's the thing. They grew from one million to ten million dollars, right? And and a lot of that had to do with CARES Act funding and just you know really their mission was in the epicenter of of like societal turmoil. So there was a lot of money coming to this organization. They were, you know, adding money to their infrastructure, their capacity, uh, their retention, the culture, right? All of that. So what we did, and I was very privy to this and, and involved, is we looked at the entire payroll and we said, okay, we can do up to 12% of a pay raise. Everyone will get 5%. Like that was the flat kind of like cost of living everyone will get 5%. Managers get to decide on that other 5% based off of performance. So someone could get, or sorry, up to that, that let's say that 12%, right? So there's still a little bit more of a, of a leeway. So someone could get that base five if they're not performing. Everyone gets that base five, but then you've got this, you know, other points, if you will. And so we really left that up to the supervisor of the team uh, to say, okay, based off of their performance, I'm going to give this person the whole shebang and they're getting all six, seven additional, you know, points, whatever. Some might be, oh, I'm going to give them two because there's still opportunity for improvement, right? But that was very much, you know, we started at what is the equitable pay raise across, you know, across the entire payroll. Um, yeah. And then we did merit base, our performance base rather, you know, above and beyond that. But here's the other thing I want to mention. If you're doing like a 3% or a flat rate, the other thing you have to consider is compression. And so if one person is coming up at 3%, right? And then someone else, it, it, like you don't have much of a bandwidth, then you're really not changing the dynamics of the pay. And I have to be honest, even though you say and you ask people not to talk about pay, it's talked about, right? Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. It's talked about. And then it's also, I love the public knowledge, right? And that comes from a DEI lens. When we when we post a posting, a new job post, I affirmatively agree we have to post the hiring salary. And I actually, Jack, will not even share on LinkedIn or with anyone a job opportunity unless it has the pay range, right? Yeah, I so agree. A lot to think about there. And that you're right. Um, kudos to you, Jack, for being the disruptor. 3%, it's cute, Bryce, but it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not going to retain. And especially if you're <laughs> concerned, right, about, about retaining your staff, you need yeah. to be concerned about that 3%. Well, I like your pay model better than the one I gave. I'm, I'm conceding that to you because it, okay. it has that part, which I think is really important, incentivize employees and telling supervisors they can incentivize their high performing employees. That's good. Yeah. And it's giving them the ability, right? Like you can yep. give them 
all six, seven percent, or you can give them somewhere in between. So I just learned that. So I'm I'm happy to share. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Ooh, this is a double doozy. Name withheld, state withheld. Okay. Some people within our state nonprofit association are thinking about setting up a subgroup of nonprofit marketing professionals to meet and exchange ideas every month or maybe quarterly. Oddly enough, this is causing quite a bit of drama dun, 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 within the state <laughs> association. We don't want to take dues or anything like that, but are coming up against some bad feelings. No wonder this is name and state with L. Jack. <laughs> So, you know, state association, this is a membership organization and memberships thrive and survive because it, it gives benefits to the members. So the first question I have, well, I have lots of questions like, why is this causing a drama? I have no idea what. So, you know, I think it's great that uh, a group of marketing professionals want to form a subgroup. You and I belong to one of the, the largest associations. AFP and right. AFP has many subgroups. How bad would it be if we didn't have LGBTQ plus subgroup or African Americans in fundraising subgroup or Latin X subgroups? You know, the thing about these subgroups, they educate us. They educate the wider association. So I'm not against a subgroup for me. But I think they have to look and see why is this causing such a drama or bad feelings? It's so it would be so great for us to hear from a marketing subgroup. Let's say this association is a is a fundraising association. Marketing and fundraising are so related. I would like to I can't think of any reason why we wouldn't allow them to have a subgroup. Yeah. Subgroups bring perspectives to the association that we might not have. I'm all for it as well. I don't I don't know where the drama is coming from. I can only imagine, Jack, that perhaps, and I'm putting words in, in mouths, perhaps the drama is coming from the association wants to monetize this subgroup. But here's the thing. People will automatically, like, you know, gravitate towards people of like-mindedness, right? And so, I mean, we even talked about this, right? Like, like we talk offline outside of this, even though we, yep. we connected through the nonprofit show, I was a part of a grant writing subgroup that was a break off of AFP, right? I, ironically, you mentioned AFP. So I, I just think this will naturally happen, but here's where I want you to focus is when someone says, oh, how did you meet each other? You say, well, we were a part of X, Y, and Z association. And then that's really going to come back to the benefit of the association. So again, I can only imagine the drama is back to perhaps the monetization of a subgroup and maybe even having some controls, right? Of what that looks yeah. like. Yeah. But I just think like-minded people will connect with like-minded people. That's right. And if they want to form a subgroup, let them do it. Let yeah. Them, it's fine. What's the, I don't, I really don't know the drama. I really don't. And maybe. You know, I would, uh, I would love to know. Yeah. Name withheld, help. slide into our DMs and let us know the drama. <laughs> yeah, totally. We want, know, we want to know what that is, but, um, but yeah, I'm all for it. And I, I think people will certainly, you know, come, come together, converse, support one another, maybe even consult on similar you know, ideas just as a previous, you know, uh, question was about the West Coast, the East Coast. Like there's yeah. all ways I think to support each other, but hey, Jack, we did it. Another did set it. of questions from our amazing viewers across, I'm going to say the globe, because let's yeah. be honest, this is, this is expanding beyond uh, the the states, but Jack Alato, CFRE and trainer at Fundraising Academy. So very grateful to have you here um, every single time that we get to have you. Again, thank you to Fundraising Academy at National University uh, for having these Fridays and also to our other very supportive uh, partners. So a thank you to Bloomerang, also American Nonprofit Academy, back to Fundraising Academy at National University. 
where we just had Cultivate on June 1, and there will be another Cultivate next year. So stay tuned to that. Make sure you get their, their information. Also, thank you to Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These companies, day in, day out, support us, but mostly they support you, all 1.8 million registered nonprofits across the U.S. So um, it's it's really been a, a pleasure. Well, hey, it is Friday, Jack, and you've got uh, some traveling to do. Yes, I do. And you know what I'm going to do when I get off? I'm going to get that app. I didn't Ooh. realize that it was it was live. I, I have my phone right here. What? And I'm going yeah. to sign into that app because later today, I'm going to yes. be able to see this show. It's going to pop up. It's going to give you that notification. I love it because as as our viewers know, there's some days that I'm not on. Um, I was just traveling, as I mentioned, I know, in Chicago <laughs> and uh, speaking at a conference. And um, I still got, you know, those notifications. So make sure make sure you you definitely do that. So, Jack, always a pleasure. Thank you. Same here. Thank and you. to all of you yeah, that joined us live, uh, thank you. If you're watching the recording, thank you as well. And as yeah. we end every single episode, we invite you to please stay well so you can do well. And we'll see you back here next week. Have fun, Jack. Safe travels.